Welcome back to the reInvent podcast. On today's show, I interview Gary Jackson of Jackson's Real Food Market. A decade ago, Gary went through a personal health crisis, which led him to thinking about food differently, how it is grown, how we consume it, and the impact not only on ourselves, but the environment. Today, Jackson's is a true disruptor in the food industry. In this episode, we chat about family nutrition, sustainable agriculture, biodiverse farming in South Africa, why certified organic produce is difficult to source, as well as eating healthily on a tight budget, and a whole lot more. To find out more about Jackson's, please go to the link in the show notes. Before we get into the main themes about what we're going to discuss today, I'd like to chat with you about your personal health journey and what led you to this place where you changed, just about changed your entire career. Sure. Um, so I started, um, I started as a student, like most students, um, uh, you know, just eating fast food and takeaways. But at that stage in my life, I didn't realize. And only after I started eating badly did I, re- I wasn't feeling great. I mean, I'd, I'd carry on, but I wasn't feeling great. And I went back and really sat with my mom again and said, what actually happened uh, to my journey? And it went straight from birth. I couldn't take um, cow's milk. I was apparently allergic to proteins. I had allergies like crazy as a child. Runny nose, lots of sinus itchy skin, a whole lot of things, and it, it was crazy. So, so I kind of we fumbled through through a, quite an unhealthy childhood and then got into student life and, you know, ate two-minute noodles and just something was, was missing, which wasn't great. Uh, and then um, one of my, my uh, life ambitions from a youngster, we're talking about standard six, was to get into international fast foods. So what I did was I ended up um, applying for a local franchise to one of the top international uh, brands and uh, somehow got accepted um, and spent the next seven years in that world. And it was, uh, it was interesting because, again, it was possibly the wrong path for me, um, but I learned a lot from it. Uh, I learned a lot about food and nutrition and uh, the just the way. effect of, yeah. of um, you know, fast food and, and was, was really feeling uncomfortable with the way they marketed fast foods, uh, the fact that they discounted it so much um, and, and really were, were hell-bent on getting the masses to eat this food regularly. And, uh, you know, the question always came up was, you know, where's the nutrient density? So it was a whole thing. But what happened was I personally got ill because I guess, you know, when you're working in that world, that's all you eat. So you know, doing 18 hour days, um, at least three, four times a week, eating three times a day, um, my own body just collapsed and got really, really sick. I had, um, I was admitted into hospital, uh, numerous things. I had extremely high cholesterol, blood pressure, I had kidney stones, I had brain fog, I was like a zombie and uh, you know it, it was just not good. So I ended up selling those, all those, all my, all my interests in, in that field. At what point did you tie it up to food? Did you realize it was actually what you were eating that was causing the issue? Well, it was a bit of both. I mean, obviously, I started off on a bad footing when I was allergic to proteins and that. But I think, um, for me, the, the kidney stones was a worry, personally. Mm. I, I, I realized that I clearly wasn't hydrating with water. I was probably hydrating with soda. And, you know, the docs and the specialists at the time said, exactly how much salt are you eating? Exactly how much sugar are you eating and how much plant-based food are you eating? How many, when do you eat vegetables? And the vegetables would be the lettuce in the bun. So I think that was the jolt of like, hang on a minute, something's not great. But I think more is I met a girl and she was, uh, she's Greek, Greek origin. And she put me on a Mediterranean diet straight after this episode in the fast foods. And it took three months, literally three months, and even shorter, and I started seeing benefits. I just ate whole foods, I ate lots of plants, I ate good meat, lots of olive oil, um, and the occasional glass of red wine, which, which they, they do. Mm-hmm. And um, I just turned around yeah. massively. All those symptoms disappeared. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the penny dropped a bit too late in life 
we're talking like 38, but never late. No, not too late. Oh, yeah. It's never too late. I just learn and um, realize that, hang on a minute, without taking a single drug, I could have, I could reverse, and I did personally, reverse my my conditions and my symptoms, which are terrible. They disappeared. Yes. You know, I started getting my brain back, and that was important. Yeah. Um, you know, besides all the other benefits, for me, just getting the mental clarity back. Mm. Yeah, it makes me wonder how many of us just think it's a natural function of aging, that you're just never going to feel right, you may need to go on antihypertensives, but don't actually realize it's physically what we're doing to ourselves and you don't have to suffer. And it's quick. When you start eating right, how fast your body responds. Within a couple of days, you feel markedly better. And then you can start comparing, you know, um, you know most of us are living in this state of dis-ease and we don't know better. And that is so frightening. Because we, we, you know, we, we, we don't take responsibility for that. Yeah, so it's, it's so, so true. And I mean, just on that point, you, you know, it's the, it's the quote that I often, often talk about. And that is, you don't have to feel this bad. Yes. You don't have to feel this bad. So until you felt great, you just don't realize how bad you actually feel. Yeah. And I think there are thousands of people out there, millions, that feel bad every day. And with a few course corrections, can literally That's change it. their lives yes and they don't have to upheave their lives so the perception is you have to spend a fortune which you proved is not true and um, we'll talk about that just now and you don't have to make massive changes but a few fundamental changes lead to a few form few more fundamental changes and you can't go back eventually you can't that's the you thing can't. once you're on that ladder yeah. you want to learn more yeah and you realize if I learn more and I read more and I understand my own body more, I'm only going to have a longer, better life. Yes. And when your brain comes back, that is that is just the most incredible feeling. Yeah. So what was the, the point where you decided, I'm going to go back into retail and I'm going to change the way the world eats? Because Jackson's is South Africa's answer to Whole Foods. It's the only really the only supermarket we've got where you can walk into your stores and know that uh, I feel very comfortable buying anything in here for my child because it's probably pesticide free, it's more than less organically grown, I've got absolute confidence that what I'm putting in my mouth is going to benefit me. So what was the point where you decided that's it, I'm going to change the way that this country eats? So it was um, a gradual process, it yeah. wasn't like an aha moment, it was a whole lot of little things that happened, uh, but I essentially started to, to think to myself, um, for me to stay on this health path, where would I shop and where would I eat out? And that became scary Yeah. because I, I just there couldn't afford no to eat out. Mm. And I, I mean, not afford to eat out, I just health-wise couldn't afford to yes. eat out because you end up regretting it. Mm. And to be social, you end up eating the wrong foods and the wrong sources and, you know, and, and unfortunately, in South Africa, the food business is driven around give you a satisfying meal at the lowest possible cost to the restaurant and the highest possible cost to the customer. Yeah. And, and, and that for me didn't make sense because you kind of need to fuel up rather than just fill up. Yes. And, and that was um, where, you know, I got frustrated and I, I said to myself, well, what if I could build... And it was a hell of a risk, and I mean, I still don't know how I did that, was if I just forgot about what other people wanted or thought they wanted, or maybe didn't even know what they wanted. But if I built a small supermarket and a small restaurant where I would feel comfortable eating and where I could fuel up, perhaps there were other people out there that I could convince and so we started the journey. Yes. Now, I remember your first store, and it was tiny, and now you've got two enormous stores. And do you ever look back and go, I understand the whole point of this now. I understand I had to spend that time in, in retail, retail stores and fast food chains to understand how this works so I could bring this ultimately to the bigger picture of the scheme of things. Have you ever really looked back and questioned the journey and thought, well, it was terrible while it was happening, but I see the point. Absolutely, um, I do, um, but I also understand that we're also on the ladder, yeah. and we've maybe only gone two rungs up that ladder, and the ladder is a long ladder. So you know that's exciting because what's the future what's hold? What does the future hold? And I think um, absolutely, it was. It was. We look back and go, there are more people that felt like I felt in absolutely. the downtime, and you know I think the encouragement to 
grow the brand was around getting customer feedback. Yes. Saying, you know, I can't go and eat supermarket meat, normal supermarket meat. I can't have eggs from another place and I don't have to pay more. I can still come here, you know, which was great. And and I saw I saw that gap um, where, where customers actually said, I feel better. And I think that happened hundreds and hundreds of times. And we built up a nice loyal customer base and people honestly felt that they, you know, without greenwashing or, you know, lying to customers blatantly, it was just about helping people along the journey. And what was awesome in that journey in the small shop, I mean, literally the size of two, two like car garage, it was we could interact with customers and we could I could really find out what they were thinking, how they were feeling. And it was scary sometimes because you'd get someone catching you in the corner and sharing their entire history with them. And you know, you could you could guide them slightly and say, Well, why yeah. don't you try that and try that? And then they'd come back and tell you. So it was it was an awesome um, time. It was 18 months where we we could just sense what was happening there. So that was more of an experiment. Um, and then I don't know what happened after that. It just got blurry and bang, we opened up a big store yeah. and a year later we opened up another big store. I mean, I, I don't know how that happened. We were probably crazy to do that. Yeah, I think these things just take on a life of the, their own because you're driven by something bigger than your own fears often because you just know you've got to do this. It's almost a responsibility and you, you go out the new wing it. And the stress is insane, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's almost like a commitment to something else. Uh, I think all of us in this in this industry, whether it's functional medicine or nutrition, are driven by something bigger than ourselves because we realize there's such a need and the drive to help people is enormous because there's it's it's huge. Just to go back to the subject of cost of healthy eating, I know this is this is a, a topic that never goes away. And you've proven in your own store with your own staff how it can be really cost effective. Do you want to just chat about that for a little bit? Yeah, I think a lot of people um, get put off, um, you know, going the health route because it goes, it's expensive. Um, but again, if you're really honest with yourself, health route means you're eating fresh food from a farm, a local farm that hasn't sprayed with insecticides and has clean soil. So ultimately, you you know, if you stick to that, so when you start going for the fancy stuff, and you know, I'm talking about highly processed plant-based foods, or you go for a gluten-free biscuit with, you know, um, date syrup on, those value adds will end up costing you. So just as you do in a normal supermarket, you just got to navigate and plan and think. And I think that's where people don't go. They don't plan it. They They just wing it and walk into a supermarket and start filling a trolley. And we often have to stop those people and say, empty your trolley. What exactly are you here for? What are your reasons? Do you, you know, do you know exactly what your health issues are? Take them back first. Um, People rush into it thinking it's just going to be the silver bullet and it's not. You've got to do a lot more before. And I guess, you know, like you've done before, you, you help people prep, plan, think and understand Mm. before you just go off in the wrong direction sure. again because you've spent your whole life in the wrong direction, the chances you're going to go in the wrong direction again are high. Well, yeah. How many people do you see go into your store and just make a beeline for the ready-prepared food without looking at, at the ingredients? You know, a lot of us are phobic of ingredients because we've got to take an, a bit of time and make a salad instead of buying a ready-made salad. And they also they look at a packet of organic walnuts and go, wow, this is too expensive, and they walk out. It's like, that's not the point here. The point is the eggs cost what they cost anywhere else, maybe a rand more, but that's really what you should be buying to start off with, is the ingredients yeah. to make a meal for yourself. The yeah. skill set has disappeared, and I think that's also where the problem comes in, where we need to educate people into how to put together a set, how to boil an egg. You know, we, we do cooking classes, and there are many people who don't know how to boil an egg. It sounds bizarre, but it's true. So there's, there's almost a chunk of time that was missing in this generation, definitely the millennials. Most millennials, unless their parents are involved, couldn't possibly feed themselves. We are sitting with a, a different kind of food crisis coming along where people cannot <laughs> feed themselves, yeah. let alone make a healthy choice. Yeah. So, you know, we, we spoke a while ago about um, organ meats. 
and the health benefits of organ meats. And you did that experiment with your staff to show them that, you know, you can eat all these healthy foods and it won't cost you much more than a loaf of bread and a Coke. Do you want to go just so, 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 you know, if you look at the South Africa's minimum wage of, of about 3,000 odd, and I mean, we pay well above the minimum wage, yeah. we over 4,000. Um, per, per month for our entry level staff but if you had to take that budget and you had to now try and feed a family of four it's almost impossible. It's, it's impossible so so you know you you go with reading pamphlets in these big newspapers that you get weekly and you just go and buy it cheap so you you've got to fill your family so no one says they're hungry so you naturally dive into millipup and you dive into white bread and you buy cheap sodas um, because you're doing your job as a head of the family, you're feeding people so no one cries of hunger. And, and that's the sad part about it because over time, white bread, mini pup, and so sugary drinks have become crazy expensive. So we did a, a very quick experiment where we took four of our staff members and we, um, we asked them what would they buy for lunch. And they said we'd buy a loaf of uh, white bread, uh, two liter Coke, and we'd go and sit in the canteen and we'd share it. And that's what they did day in and day out. And, you know, we, we just said, you guys are crazy. I mean, you can really get more bang for your buck than that. So that cost, I think, 36, 37 Rand to put that meal together. I then said to them, I'll cook you lunch tomorrow with 37 Rand. And I went into the markets and I bought um, some chicken hearts, which are delicious, by the way. They, they're better than livers. Mm. Uh, and I do think organ meat, especially our hearts, is a clean, Very. Uh, really clean mm. Uh, organ meat and and tender and tasty a little bit of uh, peri peri um we we got a like literally an armful of uh, greens which we steamed with a little bit of olive oil and um we didn't buy sugary drinks we bought a two liter of kombucha and people ate for the same amount and i showed them the slip and they showed me their slip and it was the same amount and what was interesting after that was I asked them what they ate for dinner and they said, you know, we were quite full at dinner. We weren't starving still. We didn't feel like a, a craving for something sweet. And slowly over time, we got them to realize that they could do this and they could cook maybe once every four days and put it aside in Tupperwares and then, you know, eat four times. So for 36 Rand, you know, you could feed yourself for four days. That's insane. Which is which is really good. So yeah. a lot of it is about navigating, um, you know, the aisles carefully and look out, looking out for stuff. When it comes to our greens and produce, we, we don't buy from where everybody else buys from. Yes. We buy straight from the farm. So mm. we're trying to emulate farm gate prices without putting the supplier or farmer under huge stress, which is what mainstream retail does. So, you know, we, we make sure the farmers are taken care of as well as the customer. And that's the fine balance that we're all yes. about, is how do you keep both of them happy? Yeah. Talk to me more about your suppliers, because I know you have a passion for enabling suppliers who would otherwise never get into retail to, to be able to help themselves. Yeah, that's a big driver for you. I think it went back to the small shop, you know, while we were chatting to, to customers um, and finding out, you know, doing that research in those first few months, we came across people that came, found us from nowhere. I don't know how they found us, maybe through the internet or word of mouth, but there were plenty of people out there with a product or were farming, even if it was their backyard and they were making amazing tomatoes or they were, you know, had an egg, uh, avo tree and they were picking those avos and they were literally giving them away yeah. or throwing them away or they were rotting. And slowly over time, we realized that there's a massive, massive strata of small or potential small business people out there that would never get a chance to get into mainstream retail. So the question I asked myself was if we gave these people a, a shelf space and didn't charge them for it like the other retailers sometimes do, they charge you for the shelf space. We just put their product in and let and help them incubate their business. Yes. Would, wouldn't that be an awesome way to give back? So for us, it was giving back to customers, potential customers in terms of their health and wellness. At the same time, helping these suppliers um, grow and develop their, their businesses and help them along their journey and get them, I think the word is 
like-minded maybe, but, but they needed to click with what we were doing and sure. the direction I was going. And when they got it, and when you can see in someone's eyes their passion and if they get it straight away and if they care about soil. So if you want a really decent carrot, it starts with really decent soil. Yeah. And you know, I've done this now for many, many years. And every time I walk onto a farm and I and I look at the soil and I pick it up and I feel it and I see what's in the soil. You can smell it. You can smell And you can smell yeah. the soil. And when the farmer talks about the soil more than his carrots, bingo, you know you've got yeah. yourself a farmer that's going to produce something that's nutrient dense. And I guess that's what we started off doing right back in those early days when we were chatting just now. The question I had to answer was, what if we provided nutrient-dense foods? Would there be a demand for it? And if we could show customers that this food was, in fact, nu more nutrient-dense and run a transparent food chain, would that appeal to customers? And bang, it did. Of course. People wanted to know where their food came from, how it was grown. They want to be able to pick up the phone to the farmer and ask them, you know, why, why was it, why were my... Uh, poor paws all speckled last week and the farmer will say well we had a very bad hailstorm but once you peel it you've got no problem with that poor paw and you're getting it at a fantastic price and I don't spray and I'm a small small local farmer you know and then that story would be told at dinner tables and dinner parties and slowly slowly people got it and yes. you, I think we need to to spend with our rand mm -hmm. in a in a, a social um entrepreneurial social have a social conscious when we spend can make a big difference and create jobs which is exciting and help South Africa wh who's in desperate need yes you know I think we've got such a great opportunity in this country that we don't see in Europe and you don't definitely don't see in the states when when they go off about sustainable agriculture no one talks about South Africa and in South Africa there's a lot going on that's right that nobody knows about. We're always focusing on the politics and the crime and all these, these issues, but there's so much going on that's right. And it's not perfect because our major retailers are not transparent. They won't tell you what's going on. They'll avoid you at all costs, which puts a seed of doubt in all of our minds about where, where we should be shopping. So when you do find a place where you can ask questions and you get honest answers and you can go to the farm and see for yourself and there's no sort of, you know, smoke and mirrors around these things, it makes you realize that there's something to be hopeful about in this country. And what is your, what is your take on this global move away from red meat, which we know is a completely imbalanced thought process? And honestly, you know, growing cows in Switzerland for milk is one thing, but to eat them, I've got a client who lives there and she said it costs them $75 a kilo to eat red meat. So they don't eat it because they can't afford it. And these are people who are well off. You know, so we are not looking, we're not comparing apples with apples when you look at global sustainability and agricultural sustainability and the argument for whether or not you can feed the masses without going GMO. I mean, you can, it's been proven. Um, you create more jobs when you go, when you, when you grow animals and produce more sustainably. What is your, your big picture take on this, this, this social media storm that is not, doesn't seem to be going away on sustainable agriculture and how it's affecting the planet? Yeah, it's a, that's a one heck of a question yeah. you've asked me. But uh, in essence, I always like to break things down to simplicity. And the simplicity is that social media, big food, big farmer, love sending us down the wrong path all the time. And often it's big money behind pushing us in a certain direction because the people talking and making the most noise have got a vested financial interest in something. If they make a movie, you find out later that they all, you know, have just started a vegan producing, food producing plant. And, you know, so, so you've always got to follow the money, I guess. But at the end of the day, um, we, we're faced with a couple of things. One is that farmers, livestock farmers, have really, really not done anybody any justice because... Again, they've been, under, they've been put under so much pressure by big food, and I'm talking about the big retailers, to come in at a low price. So they've had to find ways, they've been forced by the market to find ways to produce meat cheaply. And at the expense of, obviously, the animal. And so the practices that are happening in South Africa and around the world in crammed 
um, farming facilities and that you inhumanity is enough to put anybody off meat. But I don't think you should leave it there. I think that there are also thousands and thousands of farmers that are rearing meat in the right way and are going in the right direction. Um, I don't think that um, meat should be a mass-produced uh, commodity that you eat every day. You know, they always say, is follow the French. You, you battle to find an obese French person. Yeah. And they do 100 grams twice or three times a week. And But it's good quality meat. And I think that needs to be the focus. Yes. You know, have less and have good Better. quality meat along the way. But also know your farmer, know your butcher, know what's going on on the farm. I think that's important. We do need to have this groundswell against this crammed, caged kind sure. of a livestock pr production. But I don't think from a human nutrient point of view, I personally don't believe that by uh, walking away from uh, animal meats you're doing yourself a favor yeah. unless of course yeah. you've you know you've been tested in some way or you have this total intolerance to to protein to to animal protein which very very few people have it's extremely rare and you know there's there's almost every single system in the body depends on animal protein and very few people can get by on a vegan diet for for any length of time without something going drastically wrong we find that and again you know we've spoken about it it's called bio individuality mm -hmm. and that is you're as unique in terms of your whole gut as your fingerprint is unique sure. and so you know you cannot do what big food does paint everybody with the same brush and say everybody needs to eat a poor poor detox twice a week you know you can't go down this route yeah. anymore you've got to we have to take our own health into our own hands and take that responsibility and find out what upsets us and what doesn't and slowly but surely maybe sometimes in the beginning with the help of a coach or someone just guide us down the right path and give us tools and they are out there and sure. there are blood tests there is there's a myriad of stuff um, but I think the first step for Joe Public is to take one step forward and start reading start researching on the internet start understanding and then start asking questions of the people that they buy their food from and honestly if they cannot answer basic questions like you know where's this meat from is it grass-fed and if they say yes, you say, well, what is grass-fed? Explain it to me. And quickly you'll realize, you know, that that majority of retailers can't even, they're spending thousands on their packaging. They still haven't put the information on the packaging that you really want. You know, they've rather, like, made it look beautiful and put these flashy greenwashing words on. But in essence, it doesn't really tell you of the nutrient density and it goes back to that you know if Absolutely. we could if we could sell nutrient density as a commodity in other words we could price our product by nutrient density um it would be quite a game changer in south africa and yeah that's where we're heading so label legislation is there any i mean I've, i create labels for some big brands and we do the nutritionals for some very big brands in this country I don't think anyone knows how to read a label, let alone if there was a problem, where would they report it to? Because I've got, I've got the most ridiculous requests from, from big retailers asking for certain things to go on labels, which I won't do. I just, I'd rather turn, turn the job down. But where, how does a, a, a customer get some kind of recourse or explanation about what is on a label? A great example is these plant-based foods that you see at the major big retail stores. They don't contain any plants in them. It's just a list of chemicals. So what do you do as a, as a, as a customer? You know, you're wanting to do the best. Where do you turn? It's very confusing. It's extremely confusing. There's so much noise out there, um, and and it can be intimidating. Um, you know, even walking into one of our stores, you know, you can go, okay, so where do I start? What do I do? So one of the first things we did was we put magnifying glasses on our trolleys. I saw that, and a cappuccino cup holder. Absolutely. Fabulous. You can take your time. You can see everything. <laughs> you can have coffee while you're And we play some cool music in the background, it's so you can enjoy. And the air enjoy. conditioning is amazing. So yes, it's all perfect. Yeah. And it's not freezing. No, it's, it's not just freezing. A nice it's just right. So obviously, getting you in the in the right comfortable space was a big uh, task of ours. But at the end of the day, um, reading labels is important, but it's more about asking questions about what you read on the label um, because no one polices labels yet. 
and I can't see it happening in the future. So, you know, we've had crazy situations where the local fruit and veg down the road used to put organic stickers on his aging grapes say well these are they look like this because they're organic oh my and he was selling them at a higher price than his good grapes you know? and so you know people will take advantage and will try and and con the, the public so it is a, a, a nightmare but i think um you know one of the, the systems we have is that if you had to come into our store and complain or question a label we would connect you directly with that supplier and stay uh, on top of that communication between you and the supplier, yeah, they really need important. to answer every question you, you have. And at the same time, they need to, uh, if, if that customer still is unhappy, we then as the retailer will say, well, you know, let's carry on this journey with you because it's in our interest to make sure that that product is what it is yes. and everything in that product is, is healthy. It's as it's stated. So, so yeah. we've created, created this, this system where our customers are our quality controllers. And what's so awesome about it is that if you are gluten intolerant, you think you're gluten intolerant or you have a dairy intolerance and you eat product and you react, you know, the customer will rush back to me and say, Gary, there's a problem with this product. Um, go and check it out. And that'll prompt an audit, an, yes. a, an unannounced audit and check that the, the supplier hasn't changed their recipes, which is also a, nice, a nightmare out there, you know, to keep control of, of those suppliers. Let's just talk about pesticide-free versus organic. Mm. There's an expectation when we walk into a, a store like yours that everything's organic, and that's impossible because, well, there just simply isn't that kind of supply, especially in, in Africa. What is What do you try and achieve by, by you know, there's, there's a couple of products with grown organically, grown an organic method. What's the difference between organic and what what are the, the barriers to entry for a, for a farmer wanting to grow organic? So organic farming in South Africa has ended up, based on market forces, to be very expensive. And their biggest expense is to get certified mm -hmm. because there are no longer people in South Africa doing organic certification. So you have to go to the Germans or you have to go to the Swiss or you have to go to America and you've got to go and get these very expensive certifications. And in South Africa, the customer is dubious about those claims. So you can't get your premium and the premium should cover the cost of getting this certification. So it's it's really tough for a, for a small farmer. So we've had to work closely um, with a couple of other interest groups and there are a few of them to offer the service to a small farmer on getting organically grown as, as his sort of emblem. And that basically means that you if you are organic, but you aren't going to put the 60,000 Rand down for your first audit because you can't. Mm -hmm. So we've, we work closely with PGS, which is a peer um, group uh, review system. And that basically is a group of farmers, retailers and customers. And we go out to farms and the public are welcome to, to join this process it's called PGS. And we fall under the Bryanston PGS. And what really happens there is that we go out with at least 30 people and we do the audit together with the farmer. And we walk and we all ask questions and we all learn from each other. And the farmers actually score the other farmers in terms of how organically grown are you. And um, you know, if you, if you don't pass, then it's cool. We give you redress actions. You fix that in the next six months, we come back and then you know, we'll sell that, that, that product. So the drive at the moment is two main things and that is what organics is all about is is your soil healthy are you composting correctly does the farmer have the skills to grow and be called organically grown um you know does he use the right seed and and then lastly is he is he farming in a in a fair trade way so so that's a great system that that happens so to answer your question you get these various phases of farmers you know they'll start off maybe conventional then they'll go pesticide free then they'll go PGS mm. or they'll go get certified. The next step would be to get certified. We call it by a third party, which will be those international groups. But the problem is you can only get your value for those products if you export. Mm. So South Africa, very, very few people actually go the organic grown. So that's just where we had to step in as a retailer and say, how well could we become the gatekeeper of organically grown? Yeah. And that has been a hectic six-year journey with our supply base to get the relationship 
with those farmers, make sure that they understand us, we understand them, we visit those farms, we ensure that their practices are organically grown. But again, like you said, we, you know, if you cannot in this month in Joburg find a marrow, you know, customers still want marrows. So if we can only get conventionally conventional ones, we'll go out to the conventional farmers, but we'll pick the best or the most natural of those farmers. Sure. And while we're there, we'll give them an opportunity to say, listen, if you go pesticide free, even though you're going to throw 10% of your marrows away, I'll pay you a higher price to cover the cost of those 10% of the marrows. Would you consider going pesticide free? And they do. A lot of them are willing if we prepare to buy from them. And so that's what's happened over time. And so, you know, I'm not saying we have a section for conventional vegetables and that's because, you know, some people are happy to wash their vegetables either in vinegar mm. or bicarbonate of soda mm. or they buy one of those fancy sprays which you don't need to spend your money on. But, but you spray yeah. and it takes the pesticides off, you know. Yeah. But it opens up the whole debate, you know, how much goes into each product and, and that's where we we love it because that's what we love doing we explain to a customer that if you you know spray a, if you spray a field of watermelons the contamination of pesticides into that watermelon is very low versus a grape for sure or a berry yeah um, so so I think the world movement is to go as pesticide free as possible I wouldn't like to have shares in a pesticide company in the next 20 years I think you're gonna struggle yeah because we've found ways natural ways um, and that's why Africa is so exciting because we've literally got hundreds and thousands of farmers who've been farming pesticide free all their lives and their grandparents and their grandma. We're talking about a thousand years of growing product without pesticides and they've done it. So why can't we, we carry on? Yeah. And, and that's because, again, no one's looking after and supporting those small farmers and we're going to certainly do that and, and no one talks about it you know if we can collaborate and everyone can learn off everybody else we can create amazing things and this could possibly spin off to the rest of the world if they're open to it but there's so much information when we start talking to each other and there's a big fear that you know there's competitive fears and things like that but I don't think in this day and age is a place for this anymore if we don't collaborate as retailers as suppliers as consumers we're going to get nowhere we're going to stagnate like everybody else does and I think the forum that you've created where there is this communication where you can go to a farm and you can ask questions and you can share ideas is what it's going to take to move food production into the future I think this is critically important for for world agriculture as we're looking at it now and where we are at this point in time with this drama going on on social media which is it's just ridiculous it's out of control and there are a lot of activists out there and we love food activists I know the big food guys don't love food activists we do but again you know you can get behind your keyboard and throw mud at everybody mm. But again, you know, you, all you're doing is you're giving work to the public relations departments in all the big foods. So when we uh, come across a, a activist, a food activist, we'll harness the energy in and say, well, come and join this group and come yes. onto our farmers forum and, you know, help us bring on more consumers yeah. onto our farm visits. And let's build up this activism because that's what happens. There have to be numbers. Yes. of people saying we refuse to have pesticides before anyone's going to take us really seriously. So we're trying to grow that population. And, you know, what's awesome over all these years, um, we've been at this now for almost five years, is that, you know, people are starting to go to the big food guys. We're still tiny, but they every now and again say, well, if Jackson's can do paper bags, why can't you? And slowly we've seen big supermarkets, for whatever reason, starting to introduce that. And when we say, but if Jackson's can find organics, why don't you have a single organic thing on your shelf? Or at least a pesticide free. So we, we love that role of disrupting. Yes. And, and hopefully we'll be instrumental, and I think we have already been instrumental, in shifting um, the big food guys' thinking and the way that they're going to feed the populations of the future. And if they don't change, I think they're in for a hard time. And what's really encouraging is they're in the store all the time. 
You know, they don't realize how loud they talk, but you can pick up which retailer they're from. And we're so gracious and we so love it when they come and visit because, you know, if they can take away something. Yes. And, and over time, you have seen big food starting to build a health aisle and starting to, to do this and do that. And that's important. And that's so, so great. The challenge, though, is they mustn't do that you know, um, by overcharging customers. And also do it authentically, you know, not just pay lip service to because we, you can come and pick your stuff and put it in your own bag. Now we're all greeny beanie. This is just, you know, you've got to follow through. It's got to be the real thing. And I think right. that's where they're going to battle. It's not just window dressing. It is tough because, you know, again, they're chased by shareholders who are demanding, you know, them to do everything as, as cheap as possible and saving the planet and investing in the future seven generations takes money. But it's a little bit of money right now to have a massive reward in seven generations time. So, you know, again, it's, it's I, I don't think that um, enough businesses practice conscious capitalism, which is, which is what is the fundamental of our business. You know, you've, you've really don't have a shareholder on the JSE because they're gonna chase you for returns. You know, our, our shareholders are our customers and our suppliers and obviously the planet. And those are sort of the three main um, return on investments. We've got to have a return on investment on, for the people that work with us in our supply chains. Our customers must feel that they're getting great value. And again, we must be also looking after and be custodians of, of the planet and, and also to be conscious of how we can help South Africa grow and get into the right direction. As tough as it is, I think you're ahead of your time in respect of where cap green capitalism is going and the responsibility we have to future generations. So it is leading the way for a big retailer to turn their boat around takes an enormous amount of energy because they get so stuck in their ways and there's so many people to account to. Being smaller, you can think on your feet, you can make executive decisions and implement them really quickly. So this is this is the way food is gonna have to be in the in the in the short future, in the near future. And it's a worldwide trend, you know the small guys, the independents are are responding quicker to customer requests and questions. And I think that is exciting for everybody that you know this monopoly on food and farmer uh, you know and farming is is hopefully gonna whittle down the yeah. more these big food guys are encouraged to buy from small farms. I think the differentiator for you especially is the customer experience you know you can ask anybody in your stores for help and they with the same amount of knowledge they can they can really really help you so that makes a massive difference as well and you know when you look at it you're not spending more money you actually it's pretty much on par but your value proposition is so much larger yeah I think that came from from you know what kind of supermarket do I want to shop in I want to be able to ask a question and get the answer from the person I ask I don't want to be said I'll call a manager and then that manager can't answer you and then I'll call another manager and then eventually it's let me here's yeah, the head office number no I, we really do believe in empowering our guys yes. and letting them answer most questions and then getting back to you in store you know with the tough questions mm -hmm. and and we run that sort of helpline all the time um, and I'll take calls from customers mm -hmm. often on a daily basis just to to make sure people are, are making the right choices so just to veer in another direction entirely is how do you get kids to make better choices. It's a, it happens naturally. Let me <laughs> explain this to you. Yes. It happens naturally and, and we've been amazed at that. And when we started this journey, we didn't know if we could do real food at a fair price or if not less than the competitors or the big food guys or at least at the same price as them. The second challenge we had was would this food taste better? Because everyone's got this notion that when you go into a health store, it's cardboard that you're going to have to eat and it tastes mm. terrible mm. and it's got a horrible texture. And over time, we've really debunked both those, that we can be competitive, we can get a price to a customer at a very fair price and look after the farmer and make it taste good. So we've ticked those boxes and that's why we are rearing to go and we'd love to grow and we just hope that the South African economy starts getting traction so that we can, you know, uh, multiply our experience. Kids, we, we don't have a playland, but for some reason, and this is from directly from the customer's mouth, the moms say the kids pick us over someone else. Kids' tummies, in my opinion, yes. are very in tune with what's going on. When your kids are unhappy, they'll say, my tummy's sore. And that's because they're not feeling good and maybe they've got an intolerance or they're, maybe they're anxious, whatever the reason is. 
there, there is something about the moms who say that when they come to Jackson, the kid doesn't rush off. They don't go looking for a play land. They kind of sit at the table and they order themselves because they know what they like. And often kids do know what they like and, and they just don't aren't able to explain that to the parent. But, you know, if, if your kid hates cabbage, then there's a reason for that. It's not because they d don't like vegetables, that just cabbage doesn't make them feel good. So you really have to listen and talk and understand your, your, your child. But, but there is something in the nutrient density. Even if our, at best case, our, at worst case, sorry, our food was 5% more nutrient dense mm -hmm. than others, mm -hmm. I think kids' tummies pick that up. And so they finish their plates. We very seldom have food not you know, going into the dustbin. Um, so it, it's something magical. It's just that kids kind of know and, and, and they enjoy coming to Jackson's. Um, There's nothing worse at your mainstream restaurants, the kids' menu. It's just a pile of junk food. It's almost an example of what you shouldn't be eating. It's every kind of crumbed rubbish. We don't actually have a kid's menu because we don't believe in a kid's menu. Yeah. You know, and our portions, there are items on our menu that are kid sizes yes. or you share amongst the kids and they eat what the adults eat and they love it. So I, I think, um, you know, this whole thing of, of giving kids like a real cheap food, um, you know, fried fish fingers and chips, I mean, it's just no point. Yeah, and then you wonder why your kid has tummy aches and learning problems because you're giving them rubbish. You know, what's that brain going to survive on? Well, I think that's exactly it. And, you know, if, if you just paint the picture, yeah. so, so, so let's paint two pictures quickly. Mm. The, the one picture would be a family that eats in. So imagine a Jackson's eatery where you can get decent food. The family will sit together. They'll probably finish their plates. The kids won't get up and run. Mom and dad won't have this long, extensive four-hour visit. They'll have a Meal. dinner, mm -hmm. an hour, and the family's out and done. And you go to a fast food joint, you've got this kid that runs straight into the playland, gets himself worked up and sweaty. Won't eat, because they're well, too hot. Well, you try and feed them yeah. halfway through. You're pulling them out of the playland, forcing them to eat. The amount of food that gets thrown away and not eaten or taken away and left in the fridge for oh. seven days is, mm. is scary. So it's a waste of time. You know, that's not a good strategy for a, for a mother to do. Mm. You actually want to avoid that. Uh, and, and I learned that over time. If you look at, um, and, and then if they don't, um, you know, you force them to finish their, their Coke, at least drink your drink because you're going to get, you need to be dehydrated. You're going to get dehydrated, have a Coke. So, you know, they're then back in and their sugars spark. They're going to be hungry when they get home. They're going to be grumpy. They're probably not going to have a decent night's sleep and you're probably going to have to end up disciplining them. Um, so for me, I'm very passionate about uh, the nutrition of kids and their moods. And you can choose and can make serious choices for your child until they get to 18. They can choose for themselves. You choose for them. And you can manage the way your kid is. You can manage your kid's personality. Yes, you can. Because you can actually, by giving them a solid, continuous stream of nutrition, they will then be the best kid that they can be. And you'll see your true child. You won't see the irritable one or the hungry one or the one with sugar spikes. Yes, and we know for ourselves when we eat rubbish how we feel. Why do we think children are, you know, discounted from this, this effect? And why is it that mothers nowadays, and I, I can speak for myself on occasion as well, why can't we just lay down the law and say, I'm sorry, you cannot eat that cake right now? Why well, kids are clever because they'll say, but I could yesterday and, you know, you start this whole negotiation. This negotiation. So you've got to like, you really have got to like read up about how to do this or go on a course. And, it's and crazy. And just empower yourself yeah. as, the, as the feeder in, in the family, whether it's a dad or the mom or who, or... Because it is tough. It is a big problem a lot of but moms But moms are facing. tired. Yes. They've worked all day, Surprise, you know, yeah. in Johannesburg, you've got to, you know, both parents are often working flat out and they're so both exhausted. And you just want to sit in your patio and have a cup of tea uh, and just breathe. And so what do you do? You reach for your phone and you go and order pizza. The problem I have with that is that, number one, you're not ordering a nutrient-dense food yeah. item. But more importantly, um, and, and by going into many homes and seeing what happens, the kids rush off and put their nose in their takeaway box and 
sit on the phone or watch TV. Where's the family gone? The family's gone. Mm. The family's gone. And then once they've eaten, they say, go to bed. So, you know, the, the, the family need to spend time together. It doesn't have to be long, you know, but to be talking about 20, 30 minutes at a table with the entire family as a rule is such a good thing to do. I think that's the most important thing, even if your food isn't perfect, just to put the phones down and spend time talking to people in your family. At least, you know, even if you argue, it doesn't matter. At mm. least you're having a human experience. And we, we're lacking that more and more nowadays. Mm. And this sense of disconnection is just it's getting tragic. bigger. It's really tragic because if you go back into that home where the pizzas or McDonald's were delivered, the kids are sitting somewhere else in oh, the yeah. TV room. The dad may be watching sport on his own with his takeaway and the mom sitting in the kitchen reading a magazine or, or going through her phone. You know, And then you think, well, that just doesn't cut it. That's yeah. just not what it's meant to be like. Um, and, and that's why also going out and sitting in a restaurant, even if it's for 45 minutes, is great. Mm. It's really great. You sit, you and and that's what our families do. They don't sit for too long. Come in with a family. Don't make it a schlep, you know. So the kids want to come out. They don't want to sit there and go. When we're we going home, I'm bored. I'm you know. Once we're all done and we've all eaten, and the kids, mm. as soon as they start getting agitated, you say, "Come guys, let's go. We're going to go home and run in the garden." Mm. So just to wrap up, what have you seen in your opinion? What's been sort of what stands out for you that's changed? fundamentally in your industry in the last say half a decade the last five years and where do you see it going where do you see the next step so um the first part of the question was what's fundamentally changed i think that people have are starting to read more i think the millennials may they may have taken a sort of a wrong track in terms of being fast food nations um in many ways they're waking up and they're seeing that their parents are dying of diabetes, hypertension, heart attacks, cancers. And that's shifted them emotionally in a big way because you're not meant to die at 60 or 50. You're meant to get to 80. And so the, the, the living experience in a household when you lose someone young and you know that person was overweight, you know that person didn't eat well, or smoked or drank too much, you know, resonates heavily. And so you've got to question the way that you do things. So I think the the millennials and, and the new generation are reading a lot more. In fact, they're probably the most activist. The yeah. kids at 25 sure. and 35 is putting a lot of pressure on fast foods because they actually stand, stare away from, from fast foods. Mm-hmm. And I'm not slating fast foods. You know, once in a while, there's nothing wrong with going and having something from a fast food thing when you're on the rush, but you can't live on it. You know, occasionally you you can't knock it, Um, but but it can't become your lifestyle. So I think that's what I'm seeing is is shifting. People are asking more and people are are responding to not being well and demanding health. So good health is a right as opposed to a privilege and you know, must exercise that, that privilege or that right that you have, sorry, the right that you have. So I think that for me has been a fundamental shift. I'm also excited to say that the shift in the family is very slow, but it's getting there. So the fun you're going to have if you had to, let's say you came to Jackson's and you bought a spinach and kale pizza base and you got some tomatoes, you got some cheese and you rushed home as a family and you made some pizzas together from scratch Mm. and you cooked them and you ate them. Mm. That hour and a half is so awesome. As opposed to all having your nose in your your phone and your pizza box. Yes. So getting people to cook again from scratch, and it's quite intimidating because either you've had a helper cooking all your life, and there are many, many moms who never, ever, ever cook True. because they've got such stressful lives. But that act of love of actually saying, you know what, I'm going to go to the supermarket, I'm going to buy a chicken, I'm going to rub it with salt and pepper and put some lemons into the cavity and I'm going to roast it, I'm going to watch it every five minutes and I'm going to keep opening and checking and checking and checking and then I'm going to do something really simple, I'm just going to steam some broccoli and then the family sits and munches that chicken and it is eats. It's an act of love. It's so rewarding yes. for everybody. Everybody wins at that table. Getting moms to understand that cooking from scratch actually is not intimidating. And this food shows have made us freak out. We've got these fancy chefs doing these fancy things and chopping with oh, you know, these yes. amazing knife <laughs> techniques and it just looks too sterile for me. If you can engage the kids, not just 
clean up the dishes. But you chop the carrot, you chop the you tomato. You decide what we're going to eat and we cook it together. Cook it together. Yeah. Absolutely. Go find something on the internet that we're going to cook tonight. Mm. Let's experiment. Let's play. So I think that's that family time, or I yes. think we can achieve that through food. And obviously, it's one of our challenges going forward. How do we, how do we speed up the education process? Okay. How do we speed up people? asking the right questions and putting pressure on unscrupulous food suppliers and food retailers selling to make you full. You can't buy from a supermarket that wants to fill you. They must be able to give you something that's substantial and is not hurting the planet. So those are the two things that we look at. Also for us, our focus is bringing the food cost down because as we grow and as we get momentum, we are finding that our organic farmer is quite happy with, let's say, 10 rand a cabbage. And as long as we buy all his cabbage, he's happy because we're looking after him. As opposed to, you know, going to buy a conventional one at 15 rand, which is at a higher price, and then charging the customer more for something that isn't um, pesticide free. It's just crazy. So, so we're seeing that, that shift and we hope uh, in our brand that We'll continue the good work around making pesticide-free, organically grown food cheaper than conventional. It should be because it's cheaper to grow. Of you don't have to go and buy chemicals. So the point of this, this podcast is to educate people. It is to prompt them to ask questions. Do not be afraid of going into a store like yours and saying, hey, tell me about this. What are my options? What am I eating? What am I buying? And that is, that is my passion, to drive people to places like yours where they can start making better changes for themselves and their families. So thank you so much for being here. It has been, it's always a good conversation conversation and but yes it's we need to get people asking questions and I think that is how the world's going to change don't take what you see at face value there Absolutely. are better choices out there and it doesn't have to cost a bomb yeah and I think you know one of the things I've also learned um, is 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 Nikki that you you've got you can't throw too much information at someone who doesn't know yet you know we need to find a better way of making it small bite-sized little bits yes. and gems of education and slowly get of there course. you know it's overwhelming like, it's, it's almost it's like one step at a time Absolutely. that you can just just do one thing at a time back and you'll make basics, a big yeah. big change thank you so much it is Pleasure. Been amazing thank you thank you thank you this episode has been sponsored by Jackson's Whole Food Market. If you would like to win a hamper full of delicious, healthy products, please go to the link in the show notes, which can be found at reinventhealth.co.za forward slash podcast notes. Include your name and loyalty card number and stand a chance to win.